All right, so this is my trip to Israel, which I went on in June. Um, I was able to go with some of the people from my school. They had a group of people that are like friends of the college, and they had some, they had a couple extra tickets, and so they decided to take a few of the students along with them to kind of just like be able to have the chance to go to Israel, but also to kind of be grouped off with like different people to make sure that we weren't going too fast or if they needed help climbing up rocks, that kind of stuff. So we were able to meet a lot of awesome people from all over the U.S. We had people from Texas, from Michigan, from right here in Rhode Island. There were just people from, every, from a lot of places. Um, so it was really nice being able to meet all of them. And they were all born-again Christians, which was even better. So we were able to really, like, talk about the Lord and just have an amazing time. Um, so I guess I can start now? Start. All right. Okay, so this first picture is just me on a camel. This was in Jericho. We'll get some more pictures of Jericho, so I'll skip through that. But Okay. These are kind of hard to see, but this is a spot that we stopped in in the wilderness. Um, it's called the Wadi Kelt, which is, this is where um, Jesus went for 40, the 40 days that he was tempted. Um, it's probably not this exact spot, but it's in this region. Um, so <laughs> it is, once again, hard to see, but there is, in this middle picture here, down in... Um, in like the wilderness, kind of down far, there's a monastery there. And that was made a long time ago, but <laughs> in this wilderness, um, this is also where John the Baptist had lived in this area. So we'll skip through these ones. Hopefully there will be some that we can see better. But well, probably not so much. Okay, so from, um, from there, this is when we were on the road, we went to the Dead Sea. And so when we're driving, when you drive from the Dead um, to the Dead Sea, your ears start popping because you get down below sea level. So it's 430 meters below sea level. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of like when you go swimming in the Dead Sea, you're not really actually swimming. You're more like just floating there. And so we went in at night and it was really cool. Um, I was a little freaked out at first because you're walking in and like all these salt crystals you're stepping on, you're like, this kills my feet. But it was really cool. Um, the next morning we went for um, sunrise. That's this bottom picture here was sunrise and that one at the bottom corner was also sunrise. Um, and so we had our phones in the water with us and we were trying to swim on our stomach, right? and the water just automatically twirls you around. It will not let you stay on your stomach. You have to go to your back. So that was kind of crazy and weird. Um, these are more pictures. This was a hotel we stayed in. And so normally when they go to, on trips like this, they stay in like little like hostels or whatever, but we had some nice, nice, nice hotels. Okay. All right, this is Masada. So Masada is right here, this big like mountain looking area. And this middle picture is the map of all of Masada. Yeah, is there a way to brighten it or something? Is that better? Okay. All right, so in order to get over to Masada, you have to take this cable car. So that's this picture right here, these cables, and it's just this big like car. So they, they stuff like 80 people in this thing. So you're just like this. You're like, oh no, this cable is gonna break, but it didn't, we made it across. Um, right here in this bottom corner, um, that's a view from the top of Masada. Um, that, there's like a little triangle there in the sand that you can see. That's an outline of one of the Roman camps. Um, and then here we have, so in Israel, all of, there's so many archaeology sites, right? So um, this black line in the center, anything below that is original, and anything above the black line is um, something that they remade to look like it. So that we saw throughout all of our visits everywhere in Israel. Um, over here in the right corner, that is called fresco. Um, fresco is when they paint on, white, on wet stucco. So it kind of has this like weird texture to it. It's really colorful and beautiful too. Um, and then here, um, this bottom picture on the left, that's of the North Palace, just the outside of it. 
at Masada. And then here we have a model of the large bathhouse. So Masada is kind of like the history behind it. Like we had to watch the video and everything. And so Josephus Flavius, he convinced all of the people that the best way for them to survive the Roman attacks was to commit suicide. And so everyone killed themselves, and he was the only one that survived, because apparently he didn't take his own advice. <laughs> um, so here, okay, and I thought that this was cool just because, I don't know, I'm kind of weird about things. Um, but this was in the large bathhouse, and it's called the coldarium, but it's the warm room. So I was like, why is it called the warm room when it sounds like it says cold in it? So it was just weird for me. I was like, this is awesome. I love it. So this is part of the large bathhouse. And see, um, there's like the floor, and there's all of these like um, columns underneath it. Um, so that's where they would put like coals, and like they would heat up the floor so it would be warm coming up. Let's see here. OK, this is also just like another view off of the side where you can see more of the Roman camps. And then the middle um, top, that one is a model of what Masada would have looked like with all the buildings there before they all were destroyed. Um, that's just a picture of me. OK, and then this is a water cistern. So that was one of the questions someone asked. OK, we're on top of this mountain in the middle of the desert, right? Where do you get water? So they had water cisterns, but they also had this whole water system, this was the model of it, and they actually poured a bottle of water on it to show us how it would run through all of these different little like channels that they made, which was pretty cool, because that is true. Like, How would you get water on top of this thing? Um, let's see what else we have here. OK, so this here, this bottom right picture, that is we were sitting inside the temple, the synagogue, not the temple, the synagogue. Um, so this synagogue was, it was not first century. I don't remember what century it was, but they did have a synagogue. And then up here, the middle, that was um, a scribe. He was actually actively writing. So um, a couple of the people on our trip, they, they actually, he wrote their names in Hebrew for them which was really cool. It was beautiful. I was like, I kind of want my name written in Hebrew, but we weren't supposed to disturb him, so I didn't. Um, this picture right in the middle right, that is um, a picture of some of the mosaic that they have, which we'll see a lot of mosaic stuff because it's everywhere. OK, and this was us leaving Masada. So we left the same way, just over the cable car, because that day was really, really hot. So they didn't let us climb down the snake path, which was kind of sad, because everyone was like, oh, we were able to climb down the snake path before. And I'm like, <laughs> I wanted to do it. But it's OK. It's OK. OK, so this is in Getty. So in Psalms, in 62 and 63, I was going to read some of them, but I don't think I have to. Um, but David was like in the middle of the wilderness, right? He's in the desert, has nothing to drink, and all of a sudden he go, comes upon this place. And it was really cool because we go there, and um, it's all like desert, and then there's trees, and then you walk further, and there's a small waterfall and a little stream, and you keep climbing up higher and higher, and then you get to the top, and there's this big, beautiful waterfall. Um, this one was the second one, I think, the second waterfall up in that corner. And then by the time we got up to the top, we had this waterfall fall in the middle. So it was just this big like waterfall coming down, and it was beautiful. We only had like 45 minutes to climb up and climb down, so we were running out of time. And they were like, we're going to leave without you guys if you don't come back. And I'm like, ah, I'm going to be stuck in Israel. Um, but we didn't. This is us reading our Bibles. Um, there weren't many places to sit, so me and a few of the girls, we climbed up into a tree, <laughs> which is kind of cool. And they have, um, so when we were walking in there, this is a rock bunny, which you can't really see it because the picture was bad anyway. But a rock bunny is this like big rodent type thing, kind of woodchuck looking. Um, but they just chill out in the rocks. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and so on our way back down, we were running late. And so we were on this path here, and we got stuck, the upper right one. We were on that path going down, and a bunch of people were in front of us, and we were about to be late. So we actually, I didn't lead this. One of the other guys did. We climbed down this um, 
this like bank in here. So we had rocks and dirt all in our shoes like all day. It was bad, but it was fun. It was a good time. Okay, this is a spot where we stopped to look at where um, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is like a pretty big deal. Like this is amazing. So how they found them was this guy, Muhammad Adib or something like that. Yeah. Um, he was a shepherd and one of his goats got stuck in a cave. So he kind of went to go look for it. He threw a stone into the cave and he heard pottery smash. So he was like, hmm, wonder what that was. So he went in the cave and he found all these scrolls. So he brought them back to his wife and she was like, you should go to Bethlehem and sell these. So he's on his way to Bethlehem and he sees a, shoe, a shoemaker. He sees a little shoe stop, shop. And so he goes in there and he's like, hmm, I could really get a nice pair of shoes made out of these. And so he says that to the shoemaker and the shoemaker knew there's something really amazing about these and I can't just make a shoe out of them. So he told them, listen, you can have whatever pair of shoes you want if you leave the, these scrolls for me. And so he ended up doing it. <laughs> a smart man, but... <laughs> So um, the, the shoemaker ended up selling them to Assyrian monks and made a ton of money. And that's what they've like, used to um, compile like, the Bible. And they have not found um, Nehemiah or Ruth. I think those are the two they haven't found. But um, yeah, so that was a pretty awesome, a pr pretty cool place to stop and see. Um, and then here's Jericho. Okay, so Jericho. Well, this bottom picture is dark here, but um, it's like one of their, um, their soldiers. He um, is border um, patrol. So Israel is split up into three different areas. You have area A, which is under Palestinian control. No Israelis are allowed there. Area B is under Israeli control. Palestinians are allowed to go to area B. And then area C is under Israeli control. No Palestinians are allowed. So. Um, Jericho is an area A spot, so when we were driving to Jericho, we had to go through this like station, and they actually stopped and stopped us and came walked through our bus to make sure we weren't like terrorists or crazy people or whatever. Um, so that was kind of freaky at first. I was a little scared, but it was really okay. Um, our tour guide for this day, he was Israeli. And so when we were in Jericho, he was very on his toes. Like you could tell he was not comfortable where he was. Um, but he was allowed to be there since he's a tour guide. So here in Jericho, we stopped at this little place and um, got to ride a camel, which was kind of cool. Other than you feel like you're breaking its legs when it sits down. <laughs> that kind of hurt my heart. Um, <laughs> but that's pretty much all we did in Jericho. We like walked around a little bit and went to this place and had lunch. Wasn't a long stop, but it was still fun to be able to go there. Um, oh, we did stop at this lookout here, which that was cool too. The Jezreel Valley, and so we did see a lot of things. And this one down here is the view of Gilboa from across the way, but that was just driving in the bus. So this was our second night we stopped in Tiberias which Tiberias is my favorite because it's kind of like a small town, but it's really beautiful and awesome. So we're right on the Sea of Galilee, which I loved it. Um, oh, down here, this is a picture of an ambulance because I always try to take pictures of ambulances in other countries because it fascinates me. And this one is a picture of a boat in the Sea of Galilee. And this was the view from my hotel, which is beautiful. <laughs> um, and then that one's just a tree coming out of a restaurant, which I thought was cool. Um, OK, this was when we went to Mount Arbel. Um, so this is the place. This is actually the one that I have a couple verses that I believe Rodney is going to read. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so Mount Arbel here, we were sitting here and we read through that passage and some other passages, and um, we also had some fighter jets. They were practicing. The Air Force was out um, doing their normal, I don't know what they're called, <coughs> but it was kind of scary because I thought that they were going to fly over our heads and like hit us or something, but they didn't. So here we have this view of the Via, Mar the Via Maris, which is like one of the main highways. So right from here, from Mount Arbel, you see all of these roads that intersect and go to all different lands. So here's where Jesus told them. It was after he did the call of um, them being fishers of men. But basically here he's like, we're going out to all the lands. Let's go, people. Grab your bags. We're not just staying here. We're going. So this was like really like, I loved this spot. Because like with me having that like mindset of missions kind of going towards that area, I was like, this is awesome. I would love, like this is like, it was really a good area for us, for a lot of us. And you also get the view of the Golan Heights, which pretty much whoever um, has possession or is in control of the Golan Heights is the one in power in that area. So for a while, um, Israel didn't have that. They do have the Golan Heights right now, which was, is pretty cool. Okay, Okay. so from, um, from there we went to Migdal, which is where Mary Magdalene was from. So here on this left side here, the left top one, this is a picture of a first century synagogue that they found, which is an amazing like, discovery really because first century, this is like a place where Jesus could have been. Um, there's a lot of mosaic so here we have first century mosaic. And you can tell the difference kind of between first century versus um, fourth century and stuff for the mosaic. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, this middle one. So Migdal has, they were going to be under Roman attack. And so they took the columns from the synagogue and they made a roadblock with them. Um, the synagogue was like their big, like, they just loved it. They took a lot of time to build this synagogue, and so when they took those columns down, they were really heartbroken, but they were trying to protect themselves. Well, when the Romans came in, they killed all of the elders of this town, and they made all of the young people into slaves. So no one ever returned, so those columns still remain there, and they never were able to come back and rebuild the synagogue. <coughs> this town was known um, for their fish sauce, so over here in the bottom right corner, that is um, a picture of their fish shops and bakeries that they would have had. And then, okay, so this is kind of like um, an area that's being, um, the dig is being done by the Catholics. So they have all these little like churches and sanctuaries kind of. So this one on the bottom right, that's like an area where it kind of represents the woman who um, touched the bottom of Jesus' robe. So they say that people can get healed. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's skip that. But it was a cool little stop, it was. And so from there we went to, um, it's not called the Jesus Boat Museum, but they call it the Jesus Boat. So um, we went to this museum, and first we went out, we sat on this like pier type thing, so we were sitting by the water. And that's the Sea of Galilee there. On one side you can see um, Migdal, and then the other side, you can see um, Capernaum. And so we were sitting there, and that was really a beautiful area. Um, so then we went in, and so this is a boat that they found in the Sea of Galilee. So all of a sudden, one day, someone looks out, and it was kind of, um, it was in a drought. So, well, it's in the desert, so it probably is, happens often. But um, the Sea of Galilee went down quite low, and they saw this brown thing hanging out, and at first they thought it was a rock. But so they went in, they looked at it, and it was wood. And so they're like, what is this thing? So they called in some like, experts for archaeology and stuff, and um, they found out that it was a boat, and it's actually first century. Um, so in order to get it out, they had to like, keep it wet, so they had like this like, hose or whatever that they were spraying it off with constantly. And... Um, they used liquid foam on the inside and outside to kind of stabilize it so they could move it out with a crane. But this took like a lot of work for them to do this. Um, so now they had this in the museum. So I was like, I was thrilled. I was like, I took pictures. This middle picture is me next to it. So it was pretty cool. Um, 
And then from there, we went to um, the Church of the Primacy of Peter. So um, this also is kind of done by the Catholic Church, so it's all about the different um, saints and everything. Um, but this is actually the area where, where Jesus helped the disciples clean their nets and called them to be fishers of men. Um, so, Mason, Matthew 4, 18 to 23, please. Awesome. Thank you. So this was a really cool spot. Um, I take pictures a lot with my Bible, um, with the area, and with the verses that we're at, because it helps you remember like where you read it, and it's just it feels like really special to be able to read your Bible there. Um, so they gave us a few minutes, like ten or fifteen minutes, to kind of just sit by ourselves, read through um, that section, and pray or journal, whatever we could do. So we were able to sit there. Um, which was really, really nice. Okay, and then we went to Capernaum or Capernaum. I don't know. Capernaum. We'll go with that one. <laughs> I can never say it right. Um, so Capernaum. So here they have this like, this like church thing that's built over Peter's house. So we got to go in here and in, in that one right there, you can you should be able to see Peter's house. So they had glass over it, and it's just a bunch of, like, the stones, like, the normal, like, look for that. So um, back in this time, houses were really, really small. And so they would have multiple, like, family members living in one house, and it was mainly just for sleeping. They would cook and do everything else outside. Or the synagogue was actually used as like a communal area. It was kind of like their community center. They would meet there. And so it was really a special, special place for them. Um, so this, whoop. I went too fast, I think. So this area here, this is like where the synagogue would be, kind of towards the left. And this is just like a lot of the ruins that they've uncovered here in Capernaum. And here, this is underneath the building that we were standing in. So this is like an a actual like straight on view of where Peter's house and some of the other houses would have been. Um, let's see. Oh, wrong way, sorry. OK, yeah. And here's the synagogue there again. And this synagogue is actually fourth century. But about four feet under this synagogue is the first century synagogue but they didn't want to destroy one synagogue to uncover an older one. So they left this one, but they do know that the other one is underneath it. Um, and so this synagogue here is made out of limestone. So that's, um, they know that that is from another place, like those rocks were brought in. OK, and then here. Um, this is just, they kind of gave us time to like sit by the rocks. <laughs> I like my pictures of my feet, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> okay, and so um, this night we were able to go on a boat. Um, it was really, it's the only boat company in Israel that is run by Christians, and we were able to go on it. The man that was our, um, our like captain, I guess, of the boat, his name is Daniel, and he's also a musician, so he writes his own songs about the Lord and about Jerusalem and Israel in general. So it was really a treat to be able to hear him singing in English, but also in Hebrew. And so they just had like praise music and all this like beautiful Christian music playing the whole trip. And we went right at sunset, and it was just beautiful. Sitting there in this boat, and we were reading through different like stories of Jesus being on the Sea of Galilee. So I read through like the, um, 
when Jesus walked on the water. Um, that's in Mark 6, 45 through 52, which we don't have to read through that, but it's because we all know that story. But it was really cool to be able to read all those stories while we're there. It definitely made me cry. Um, it was beautiful. Um, and then after, oh, that's Daniel up there, but it's dark. It's hard to see him anyway. Oh, and then before, actually before we went on the boat, we didn't have much time, so we went to McDonald's. <laughs> yes, there's a McDonald's in, in Israel, and they just don't put cheese on their burgers, which is totally fine. But they have like the big version of what we would kind of think of our Big Mac. It's called the Big American. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Okay, here's the Jordan River. So this is a spot where like they have designated as this is where Jesus went in the water, which once again, we don't know where exactly Jesus went in the water, right? But we know that it was in this river. So um, they told us they're like, oh, maybe like this is a spot to just kind of dip your toes in because it's kind of gross looking and we don't have a ton of time. And I was like, <laughs> That's funny. I'm going all the way in. <laughs> so um, I did. So this one in the middle, that's me in the water over there. And then after I went, then a bunch of other people followed and went in the water. Um, but it was cool because once we were in the water, we got up and then through there were like trees and stuff. Like this picture here, there were trees and stuff all like around like, the water. And all of a sudden in a clearing, there were a bunch of wild horses just like chilling out there. It was beautiful. It was just really amazing. Really, really cool. Okay, this is Kersey Beach. Um, so this is, this doesn't look like a beach in these pictures, but what it is is that the tour guide we had this day, his name's Haim Cohen, and he is a, um, a very famous archaeologist over there in Israel right now. And so he had the opportunity to go to Magdala and do a dig there, but he was like, nope, I found this beach and I have to work here. So here at Percy Beach, um, this, this um, tour guide that we had, he was like a, in the Navy or whatever over in Israel. And so he knew from this point to this point going east, you would need a harbor to stop at. And so he was like, I know that in the time of Jesus, he would have needed a harbor when he was sailing. So he actually went and started this dig, and he was kind of figuring by the location it would have to be around this area. So all of these like big like um, reeds and stuff were growing. So he went in there, he chopped a bunch of them down, and he found the breakwater, and then he found where the harbor would have been. And actually there, there's also a first century synagogue. So he found all of that stuff right here. Um, so. So in one of these pictures, you can see where the, um, this one I think, is you can see where like the breakwater starts. And then um, here's the synagogue. This is the first century synagogue. They have like sandbags and stuff where you can stand on them. Um, so that was really cool. And then here's like where it comes out to the water. And inside the water, as you go out probably about 10 feet, there's this big round thing. And it's like first century rocks and everything. And that's where they had like some kind of like little like lighthouse there. And like you can see it. And he actually had someone make a painting of what it would look like, would have looked like in that time. I don't have the picture of it, but it was really cool. Um, so down here in this picture is, that's me way out. There's like a little dot out there. That's me swimming. Um, because they told us we could go swimming, but we couldn't put our heads under the water because there's microbes in this water. People don't usually get, a, they're not usually allowed to swim the Sea of Galilee, um, but we had some connections, so they made it happen. Um, but we just couldn't put our heads under. Anytime I got anywhere close to like right here, he would yell at me. <laughs> like, I'm not putting my head under. I'm just trying to get in as far as I can. <laughs> okay, and this is when we were on the road again. So this is a picture of like the VMRS, what it would look like now. And this is the same road that like they all traveled. Everyone back in the Bible, like when um, Paul was on his road to Damascus, this is the road he would have had to travel, is the VMRS. So it's pretty cool. Very windy, so when you're in a bus and there's another bus that comes by, it gets a little scary, but it's good. Okay, when we stopped at Caesarea Philippi, um, this one's kind of, it was kind of creepy, I guess, because it, it was very pagan, a very pagan area. Um, I have to think of, 
it's talked about in Matthew 16, 13 to 21. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were caves and like there was little water areas, but we didn't stay there very long because the um, guy that we were with, he was like, this kind of freaks me out. Let's not stay here very long. But it was just nice to stop and see it. Um, we went to this national park and actually have the, um, the like map of the whole thing. But we were able to walk here and we stopped at, this is Tel Dan. So there's a lot of stuff that happened in Tel Dan and there's a lot of verses that we read in like, I think First Kings, let me see. First Kings, Judges, all of this stuff. So, um, and when we got to the top of it, there were um, like trenches for the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, um, old trenches. Um, so we were able to climb through those and that was kind of cool. And so when you're standing at the top of there, you can see Lebanon and you could really throw a rock into Lebanon. Um, but they had their Lebanon patrol guys going around. So like, yeah, we didn't throw rocks. <laughs> um, so, but basically here in Dan, so this was the nature walk part of it. It was beautiful. Lots of water and trees and, um, yep, more water and trees. It has signs that said paradise because it was one of those areas that was just absolutely beautiful. And then here in the bottom, this is where um, there was a pagan temple. And I think I have more. Oh, this is a trench. I forgot that I had pictures of those. Um, but yeah, these are the... Um, the IDF trenches up at the top. And right over there, like where that hill is, was Lebanon. Um, yeah, and this one up here, that picture on the top right, that's, um, that's Dan, where Jeroboam made pagan idols. Let's see. We were supposed to like meet up with a group, but then they kicked us out of the park. <laughs> They're like, nope, we're done. Um, so this is just like different bodies of water that we were, um, we were driving by. Um, this is like a fish farm. They use those fish to fight against malaria. So they use like the, um, the parts of fish or the oils or whatever to make um, different medications to fight against malaria. And then this is the catch water, like the rain or whatever catches all the water and they have a little raft in there that floats around to keep it moving so it doesn't become still water and get all gross. This is our last night in Tiberias. Um, they had some kind of like American ambassador there. And so at one of the restaurants we went to one night, they had, um, that ambassador was over there. So they had fireworks and they were singing God Bless America. It was so funny. We were watching it, we're like, oh, is this for us? <laughs> nope, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so it was really fun. And once again, I have another picture of an ambulance, which you can't see there, but that is an ambulance behind that um, bar. And then this is me. I always pretend I'm hanging off walls because I feel like it's fun. Um, <laughs> I'm a little, little crazy, guys. I don't know. So then this was sunrise in Tiberias. We woke up at 5, and we went to look at the sunrise, and it was beautiful. And then Caesar Premier, that was our hotel. And that's actually a picture of the hotel, but at a weird angle. Um, yeah, so this is our last day in Tiberias. I was kind of sad because I love Tiberias. So um, this day we went to Nazareth. We went to the Church of Annunciation. Um, so in here is where they have, like, the basement of Jesus' house. So you can go in here. And it's very, um, this door right here, there's a bunch of doors like this. It basically goes through and tells all, like, Bible stories. So there's pictures of a lot of different um, people of the Bible, which is cool. But um, it was very busy and crowded in here. And you couldn't really see the house too well. Um, these, once again, are just pictures. This menorah right here in the center, that's um, a crippled menorah, so it's missing some of the, the things, so it kind of shows um, the hurt and everything that's gone on in Israel, because Israel's um, symbol, national symbol, is a menorah, so that being crippled shows, like, the hurt that they've been through and everything. Um, okay, we'll go through some of these. This is a church or synagogue that... Um, was in Nazareth, under here. We went to a little um, synagogue. Oh, this one here. And they said that this would actually have been the synagogue that Jesus would have gone to as a little kid. There is a woman in our group, and she, um, she was an orphan, and she went, was in an orphanage called Nazareth. So this was like her stop. Like It was like really important to her. 
And we were just really stopping quick, and we basically ran through all the shops. And they were like, we can't stop, we can't stop, we've got to get back on the bus. And so a couple of people stayed with her so she could buy a couple little things because it was like that important. She was like, I don't even care if I get yelled at or whatever to get back on the bus. So she was able to do that. And it was, she was like crying and so, so happy about it, you know. Um, this is a lookout that we stopped at. And there's just a lot of valleys and stuff here. And it's called the Three Faiths Lookout. And I honestly don't really remember <laughs> what all of these things are. Oh, but these are trees here. Oh, wait. The trees up here, all, all the trees in that area, because it being so hot, they actually get burnt. Like, you can just see the charcoal on these trees. And it's not because anyone set fire to them. It's really, truly that hot that it burns the top of the trees. Oh, I didn't mean to skip that. OK, so. This is a tomb that we went by when we were driving on the road. And so when they were trying to expand the road, they found this. And this is actually what a first century tomb would have looked like, like pretty close to what it would be. Um, so a couple people were able to go into it. They didn't let us all get out because it was on, the, on a main road. <laughs> so they were like, liability, we don't want anyone to get killed. But um, it was just cool to even see like, the, the tombs on the side of the road. Okay, and here's Mount Carmel, and this is, this is where um, Elijah had that whole, like, battle with the prophets of Baal. So we read through that, and that was really cool. And through here, you can see, like, the city of David. You can see a bunch of, like, the different parts of Israel. Um, but it was cool to be able to be up there and read about Elijah and read that while we were there. It was one of my favorite Bible stories. I do love that. Um, Okay, I have to remember what this is, guys. Oh, this was still at Mount Carmel. This was the little church that they had at Mount Carmel, and they had a motorcycle in the parking lot, so I took a picture of that, because ambulances and motorcycles. Everyone knows when they're on a trip with me that those are the two things I need to take pictures of. <laughs> oh, and this lady right here next to me with the, um, the glasses, that's, um, that's Alice, and she's the one that um, Nazareth was so special to. So these are some of the women I was there with. They were very sweet. OK, and this is the town of um, our um, tour guide lives here. And this is this big, huge garden. And it is, um, it's like the, the garden of uh, Baha'i or Bahi like religion. I don't know how to say it. Baha'i. So it's very symmetrical. And it represents like good versus bad. So it's very, it's organized exactly how they want it. But it's basically like that religion's like headquarters. So no one's really allowed to go in. Only certain times they wanted all of us to make sure we didn't have weapons or anything to go into a garden. <laughs> it's like, this is craziness, guys. Okay, and then we went to Caesarea. Okay, and we were supposed to go to a restaurant there, but they weren't ready for us yet. And so we went into this like national park. And this isn't even like protected or anything, but it's all these mosaic. It's this house. It was um, a Jewish home during Roman times. And they can tell um, that it's Jewish because there's no like pagan gods or anything. So all of these different animals that are here, like it had like the lion and the bear and like they were domestic dogs, you could tell because they had like a, um, a collar around their neck and everything. But all of like these animals that are talked about in the Bible, like they were all there on this like floor. It was really cool. It was amazing. And so then we went to our restaurant. This is a view from our restaurant right out into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and we saw um, this middle picture here. That's actually a picture of a tomb, um, which they have a lot of those everywhere. But they're doing a lot of digs there um, in Caesarea. It's our, our, um, it was our tour guide's like, favorite place to eat. This is the Mediterranean Sea. I went um, swimming here. And I also found a bunch of sea glass. So that was fun. I liked that. So the, um, the guy from my school, he knows that everywhere we go, I just love to go swimming in every body of water possible. And he made it happen for me, which I was really excited about. OK, and this is Jerusalem. Here you have Temple Mount, and then we have the Western Wall. This is the first night, and it was also the start of Ramadan, which was Kind of tense because you had the Palestinians and the Jews all kind of together, which um, doesn't happen very often. Um, 
So it was a little, a little scary walking around, but um, we, when we were walking through the old city, we also saw Hezekiah's north wall. And then this picture here is called the Cardone, which is like the heart of the city of Jerusalem, or it was the heart of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, we went to this lookout here. Um, I think this is actually the Mount of Olives. It is. The Mount of Olives, where you can see the city of David, the upper room, and the east gate from here. And across this plain here is where, um, it might not be in this picture, actually. Oh, there's the Mount of Olives. Okay, that one. Okay, yeah, there we go. So this one's the upper room. That's the east gate. And then here's the city of David, which we do go to the city of David after, too. Um, so this was pretty cool. Oh, I did change it. So we were able to walk down from the Mount of Olives all the way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a cool walk. Right here, these are all tombs. These are all like caskets and stuff. So um, generally, they would, they would bury someone with all of their gifts and stuff. And then after a year, they would take them out and put them in little boxes to make more room for people. Oh, and we stopped at this Elvis diner in Israel. <laughs> it was really crazy and cool, but um, yeah, I put some pictures in there just because it was fun. Okay, Bet Shemesh, this is, um, this is where all of the stories of Samson took place. So we read through a lot of pictures of pictures, <laughs> read through a lot of the scripture about Samson and Judges. Um, and then here on the upper right, um, we were, when we were walking to leave, there was this rock sticking out, and they said that that's actually part of the ancient wall that was there. So it was pretty cool. I got to actually read here a lot, almost two full chapters, and I was very happy. <laughs> okay, the Valley of Elah. This is where David killed Goliath. And so I actually brought this rock home from there. Um, they asked for volunteers, two volunteers, to go walk across the valley, which, okay, so this is on the way back. This is going towards there, right here. So in the center spot, there supposedly is, that's where the, like, there was a brook that was there, and that's where all the smooth stones would have been. And so that's where David would have been coming from, to come towards where my Bible is. So from that side to here, and um, where we were standing is where Goliath and the Philistines would have been. So I was able to walk all the way out there, and um, it was the one day I decided to wear a skirt. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so anyway, I walked through this field, went and found a bunch of smooth stones and everything, broad enough back so everyone could have a couple. Well, not here, but for people that were there. Oh, and then we went to the Elvis place for lunch because our other plans got changed, so we went back there. And we went to the Israel Museum. So a lot of, there was a lot of stuff that you could tell was from the Philistine time, just because of how big it was. So you have this tomb, which was like really, really, it doesn't look big right there, but it was a big tomb. And then the water buffalo found in the Joven Valley. Um, so the Arid, they thought that it was a um, fortified city. And through digging, they found that indeed it was a fortified city. It's like, go figure, right? So then these are weapons, and then pottery. Um, so this pottery had a chariot on it, and so the Philistines had chariots, and that's why they, weren't, they never really went into the mountains. So that's how they knew that um, the Philistine pottery was in this um, Israeli tomb. Um, this is the David inscription, which I'm pretty sure I wrote down what that was. Whoops. Oh. The David inscription was found upside down in Tel Dan, so it just looked like this ordinary, everyday rock. And they flipped it upside down, and it was this inscription that had David's name on it and everything. So it's pretty cool. Um, let's see. I've taken a long time. Um, this is Hezekiah's um, stamp, or bula is like the word for it. Um, so it was pretty, it was neat seeing that. This is another. Um, like tomb with pottery and everything. And then that one is, I wrote it down again. Um, oh, that piece of silver is actually, um, it was found by, by a middle schooler in archeology span club. That's kind of funny. <laughs> okay. Oh, and then this rock right here is the Israel Estella. 
And that's the first time Israel was mentioned in their own country. So all these things were kind of like a big deal. We went through this museum really, really fast. Um, a lot of pottery. These are the big like jars. And it's like um, awesome to see because like when you're reading about Jesus in Cana when he turns the water into wine, these were probably similar to what they would have looked like. And then there was a heel bone that had a nail in it, which is not Jesus' heel bone, heel bone but um, it, it shows that they did do that at times. The Romans were very cruel and mean people. And this is a big model of all of Jerusalem. And then this here at the garden, it like represents... The white dome represents good, and the, like, the dark like tree-looking thing is represented bad. There's some weird stuff going on, but... Okay, and these are um, the Isaiah scroll. We weren't really allowed to take pictures in here. Our tour guide told us we were as long as we didn't have a flash, but then the, um, the security in there were yelling at us, so... <laughs> I still took a couple pictures. But this was the entrance going in there, and it was like very dark, but they have to keep it like at a certain temperature and everything for the scrolls. These ones are standing up, but that's because they're like copies. Because the other ones, if they were standing up, they would completely like crumble because they're so old. This was us in the old city. We went to a pizza place in the, um, the Christian section. And so in the Christian section, they do put cheese and meat together. It was weird. <laughs> um, this again was the Western Wall, another ambulance. Oh, I can't believe I put this picture. This is actually a toilet paper dispenser, and it cracked me up because it made me think of my dad, because it only gives you one sheet at a time. And I was like, Dad, he's going to want to put this in our house. <laughs> oh, man. But I was able to actually go to the Western Wall um, a couple times. And so they all, a lot of people go there. They touch the wall. They pray. They put their prayers into the wall sometimes. They'll write them on paper, put them in the wall. And you get separated. Women and men are never together. So the first time I did it, I was like, I don't want to separate from my group. I don't want to go. But it was totally fine. You have to go through security. They check your bags. They, you have to make sure you're um, dressed holy. So shoulders covered, knees covered. If you're not, then they give you scarves to wrap around yourself. All right, this was their, like, um, national, their, um, um, what do we call it? Like a parliament, the par yeah, the capital building or whatever, um, the Knesset or whatever. Um, so we stayed here. We talked a lot about their government, but I'm not really, like, super up to date with politics a lot. So I was listening. <laughs> um, so we have over here, we have the, um, the big menorah, which is, their national symbol, which is basically kind of equivalent to the Statue of Liberty for us. And then um, over here, these trees are shaped weird like that. And we actually saw people wearing hats like that. And we didn't know what it means. But they're the people that are um, our leaders in parliament, that they wear these like big fancy hats. So they um, shape the trees like that. OK, and this was we went to Yad Vashem, which is the um, Holocaust Museum in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, so these first pictures here are the top two, top three actually. These, this is from the Walk of Righteousness. So they plant trees for every person that helped the Jews. So people that were not Jews that helped the Jews during the Holocaust. So the whole time, a couple of us were like, I wonder if they have Corey Ten Boom. And so our tour guide didn't know. And so all of a sudden... We were going one direction. He's like, ah, oh, no, 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 let's go this way. So we go the other way around the building. And I was searching, like, it was like, Hawkeye's, like, let me try to find Corey Ten Boom, right? So all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm like I found her, I found her, I found her. I'm like yelling. Everyone's like, what's going on? I'm like, Corey Ten Boom, she's right here. And so um, a lot of us took pictures of, um, of the tree and the plaque and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was really, really cool. Because I had just finished reading The Hide in Place and I did like a speech on her and everything. So I was really just like pumped up about Cory Ten Boom. And so here they have um, a cart of what the, um, the train carts would have looked like. And here's part of the, um, the museum, which there's better pictures of the museum. We went to the Valley of the Communities. And then here is, um, we went down into the woods. They have like replicas of what the houses of the partisans would have looked like when they were in the woods and stuff hiding. And so that was cool. 
Um, this is a picture of, of the museum. It's shaped like an A. It's to make it look kind of like arms reaching out to help. This bridge right here, when you walk over it, it sounds like a train car. It was really kind of sad and scary to walk over it. Um, and this picture over here, it represents like the stone from Israel versus the stone from other places. So showing that other people from places were coming together to help to protect Israel. Um, here, this is dark, but there's, um, so the walkway, and then where there's like that darkness there, that rectangle there, those are little tiny stones, and those represent every single person, like individual people in Israel. This is a wall here, the center picture. It's a wall, and there's holes in it, and that represents the hurt. Um, and then this is a picture of, um, well, it's like a statue, really, of um, a man and a bunch of children that he had taken in a bunch of Jewish children, and he pretty much made them his own. And then the, um, the Nazis came in and told them he had to get rid of the kids, and he said that they're his kids. So they ended up killing all of them, and so they had that there. We weren't allowed to take any pictures inside just because of a respect thing, which is totally understandable. But we also went to, they had this hall of children, and oh my goodness. You walk in, and it's just pitch black in there, and they were just lights. And every light represented a child that was killed in the Holocaust. And um, it was really sad. Then we went through the whole museum and everything. And then back to Jerusalem, we didn't really stop at these places. We pretty much just like drove by them. But Montefiore, I don't know, I'm bad with these. Another ambulance, um, Mount Zion, Gordon's Calvary. So we went to a lot of these places. We were able to go into the upper room. There was, um, there's actually no other group in there when we got up there, so we sat on the floor and we talked and we read our Bibles. It was really an amazing time. And then we were able to go up to the roof and take pictures. Once again, another motorcycle. <laughs> I messed up, guys. Okay, this is the City of David. We had a different tour guide this day, and he's the one doing the dig here at the City of David. Um, so here we were at a lookout, overviewing like Jerusalem, a lot of things there. We went down this, this path. It was like really steep and narrow in order to get to underground. We were here. This is actually um, this top one on the left. It, we were in the room above it, and that leads down to the um, Gishon. Is it Gishon? Oh, man, I can't remember. It's like the pool of water. There's a, there's a name for it after it comes. Right in here in this one, um, it's really dark, but that is a big rock that is actually a remnant of, the, um, of David's temple. So that was a, a big one. This one on the far right, on the top, that is a trench for when they would sacrifice animals. It would drip the blood, it would drain the blood down. This one over here that we can't see really, it's part of a rock, and then there's a hole in the middle of it, and it was so you could tie up the goat or whatever animal you had. So this was like the, the sacrificing room, the altar and everything. Um, this is kind of an overview of all the different rooms. So this was like, pretty much I would say it was David's um, palace. And then here we went underground even deeper. And this came out to like the Canaanite pools. So we were walking down these steps that were very, very um, unstable. Um, it was a little scary. We had to help a lot of people down there. Um, but it was really cool to go into. I actually have the, um, the brochure thing for all of this stuff too. Right now this isn't like, it, all of these things are not open up to the public yet because they're still working on making it um, a little bit easier to access. So it'll take about a year or a year and a half for them to be able to actually open it up to everyone. So we were only able to go because um, my school has connections with um, the archeologist. But here, this is actually me sitting on a glass floor above the pool. So it was a very long drop and it was a little scary, but I was like, I'm doing this. So we had to walk on all of these glass floors looking down into this. Um, this pool area. So water's really like a big deal. <laughs> That's kind of like what they strive on. So this comes out to um, 
we got to go on like the, the long walk to get out of here, which equaled going through Hezekiah's tunnel. Um, so this was, that was a wall actually in Hezekiah's tunnel. I was trying to use my flash to take pictures, but it was really hard. And that is like darkness of us walking through Hezekiah's tunnel. We got pretty wet in there. Yep, see, so I got wet like up to like here. And we came out to the um, Pool of Siloam. And um, at the Pool of Siloam, we like sang a bunch of songs, we read our Bibles, it was cool. Um, then we were able to go on a tour under the Western Wall. Um, so that was pretty cool. This was a um, Market Street from the Second Temple. And there are all of these like things that you could tell it was from the time when the Muslims had it to like the time when the Jews had it. So there were definitely different things that you could tell like this is significant for each of them. All right, here we we're in Bethlehem. This was inside the tomb, not the tomb, the cave that would have been similar to the cave that Jesus was born in. Because this is like when we talk about like an inn or we talk about the stable, the stables were more like, like caves that they would keep all the animals like nice and cool. So this would have been like what their, um, the cave was that Jesus was born in. And this restaurant right here, that's called Ruth's Restaurant. And so I like that because I like Ruth a lot. Because um, it also happened in Bethlehem. We read through the story of Jesus' birth here. And then I took a bunch of pictures and went back to Jerusalem. Okay, Bethlehem is an Area A place. So um, they told us that the airport would be very suspicious if we went to an Area A place and brought our bags with us the day we were leaving. So we had to go back to our hotel to pick up our bags because they didn't want us to go to Bethlehem with them since we were going into a Palestinian area. The skate we were walking through in a bus definitely almost hit a lot of us. <laughs> Very scary drivers. St. Anne's Church. So we went here, and this is like a place where a lot of people will go and they sing. We went to other places around here too, but there were these groups from churches that just went in there and you could hear them singing like out loud, like everywhere, and it echoes. The acoustics in there are amazing. So that's one of the places where a lot of people go. The Pool of Bethesda, this was in the same place as St. Anne's Church. Um, so this was really, I liked this area. We read there again. And then we go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was beautiful. Um, lots of flowers, just really, really, really pretty. Um, we, we read there too, but we didn't stay there very long. Um, we walked on top of the walls. First we went down and like walked through like, this is King Herod's pools, and then we walked through um, a couple different like areas, and then we went to the top of, oh, this is a picture of like, that's like the temple and Temple Mount and everything, and then here's like the columns of um, what the area would have looked like then. And then this is at the top of the walls. Um, it's kind of hard to see them, but. That building right there is um, right near where, um, oh no, that's St. Anne's Church. And then close to this area, though, is where the upper room was, where we went into. All right, there's a lot of pictures, guys. We went to this little um, museum. This is a picture. This is a model of what Jerusalem looked like. And it changed. Like, they had, like, different models you could put on top of this to make it look like the different centuries. Um, yeah. This here, this bottom picture with me, the um, ground I was standing on is actually the first century road that was in the, um, the city. So, um, this was crazy day. Here we have this view. This is all of us sitting here. This is right where that piece of road was, and we sat there, talked about it, and then um, from here, our tour guide left us, and we went to um, the garden tomb. This here is um, a skull 
Hill, which is um, in Matthew, Mark, and John, it refers to the place as the Skull Hill or the Skull. And then in Luke, it calls it Calvary, which Calvary um, means skull. So this is the place that a lot of people, and okay, so it's up for debate whether Jesus was killed and buried in this area or if it was closer to the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so this area right here is like really close to the Damascus Gate, which would have been um, the direct route, like the main road in and out of the city. Um, so we looked at the tomb here, and this tomb would have been set up pretty much how we would say the tomb would have been set up for um, Jesus when he died. So I think I have pictures of inside the tomb. Maybe I don't. Um, but yeah, it was really cool to be there. And then this is us going into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the other one that some people say could be where Jesus died and was buried. Um, so yeah, under here in this rock, there's like this like whole altar thing set up, and then there's this this stone, and there's like this crack in it. So they just say that that's where the cross was nailed into the um, the mountain. And then there's a spot where um, they have designated to where Mary would have been looking at her son. And then there's a tomb in here, but um, it's it's set up differently. This tomb is from the other one in the garden tomb. But, I mean, it's up for debate. Some people think one way, some think the other way. And then we went to the mall, got some food, and then we went to the airport and we left. So that's pretty much it. And I went kind of long, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I want to just thank everyone for all of your prayers and all of your support and love all the time. And I love all of you um, so much and I just thank you for letting me do this too, share my pictures and my trip, so thank you. Can you find the Valley of Jezreel slide? Oh, sure. Didn't that bring the Bible to life? In many places, I want to take just for a few minutes here, probably about 10 minutes or so. And if you believe that one, about 10 minutes or so, I want to have us open to 1 Kings chapter number 10. 1 Kings chapter number 10. And while Heidi brings up uh, one of her slides, I asked her to bring up. We're going to take a little excursion back to the Valley of Jezreel, which she has a slide of. And, and I was looking at that. And by the way, uh, these slides will be available on the laptop here. If you want to look at it, we can save it for you and send them out to you so you can have them. There's some excellent things on there. Uh, it mostly showed me that our 20th century slide projector is starting to die, I think, on us. So it's, it's about 20 years old and still kicking, but in modern technology, eh. <laughs> so, but I want to have us turn to 1 Kings chapter number 10. We're going to look at something that happened in the Valley of Jezreel. And we, we know it's the Valley of Jezreel by the scriptures. The, the book of Hosea talks about what happened here at this time, and we're going to tie it in in a few moments with these people called the Rechabites. Now, the Rechabites were one of these groups of people that you would see that were inhabiting the land of Canaan, where the people of Israel were to go and take over. We all know about the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all those different people, but hardly any of us knows about the Rechabites. These were, these were a group of people who were known to be a, a group of nomads with no place to stay, no place to call their own. Sounds kind of like the Jews of today or in past years, and also it sounds like the Christians today who we are just passing through this land, but we have a future home in heaven. Amen? So let's turn to, well, I had Psalm 38 open that I was going to go to earlier, but 1 Kings chapter number 10.
I don't have my light up here, so it's not as good. Yeah, that's better. Now I can see. 1 Kings chapter number 10, and I'm going to start with verse number 1, and we're just going to read, read through here this morning. I think I meant 2 Kings 10. Yeah, 2 Kings 10, I'm sorry. I wrote down first and knowing that it was second. Verse number one of 2 Kings 10. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, Seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are, are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor. Look even out of the best and meetest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid, and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him, how then shall we stand? And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also and the bringers up of the children sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants, and we will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make anything. Do thou that which is good in thine eyes. So Jehu is the king of Judah, and he's got with him all of the remaining sons of Ahab. And now we all know who Ahab is and his, his lovely, beautiful wife, Jezebel. And so they were left remaining the sons of Ahab. And so here's Jehu bringing them together. And you know what he's going to do with them? He's going to wipe them out. I'm giving that away purposely right now. Verse number 6. Then he wrote a letter the second time to them, saying, If you be mine, if you will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men of your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow, this time, now the king's sons, being seventy persons, were with the great men of the city, which brought them up. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slew seventy persons and put their heads in baskets and sent them, them to Jezreel. And there came a messenger and told them, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in the two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab and Jezreel and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests until he left them none remaining. And he arose and departed and came to Samaria and he was at the shearing house in the way. Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah king of Judah and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, said, take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men, neither left he any of them. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, is thine heart right? as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. Now this Jehonadab is where we're going to look in, in Jeremiah 35. He'd be known as Jonadab also. And that name actually means God lifted up. Now let's look here at what happened with Jehu. Jehu was righteous in that he slew 
all of the house of Ahab. And now he takes Jehonadab with him, being of like mind and like heart. And he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now look what happens next. It says, Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests, let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live, but Jehu did it in subtlety, the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. So he put, out a, he put out a propaganda campaign that said that he was a worshiper of Baal and brought all, I'm going to give it away here, he brought all of the remaining followers of Baal into the temple and he slew them all. Jehonadab was with him through this all. Now let's skip ahead just because of time's sake because I only said it was going to take about 10 minutes and let's go, let's go for, skip a little bit down. Verse number 23 says, And Jehu went and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, unto the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. And they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Jehu appointed fourscore men Without and said, If any of the men whom I have brought unto your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life shall be for the life of him. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the, the guard and to the captives, Go in and slay them, let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains cast them out, and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. A draft house in that day was, it was a bathroom. It's not, as we think of a draft house, it's a place they serve beer. Well, I guess it's still the same, right? So it made it a draft house, a latrine or bathroom unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, verse number, tw number 29, and then we'll go to Jeremiah 35. How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, Jehu departed not from after them to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. See, Jehu turned out to do a mighty work of God in destroying the house of Baal, but yet he continued to worship the golden calves which Dan had made. He was the ultimate in hypocrites. He slew one idol to worship another idol. So there was no change. But think of this. Jehonadab was with him there. Jehonadab would have a, a, a legacy. He would have a testimony to the people for a long time. Jeremiah 35. Starting with verse number one. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Je Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habathana, and his brethren, and all the sons in the whole house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the house of the Lord, unto the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdalia, uh, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which were above the chamber of Messiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. 
So he brought them in, in full view of everybody inside, inside to show these people to them, right into the governor's chambers. And I set before the sons of the house of the, Re the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, or Jehonadab, who was with Jehu, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever, neither shall you build houses, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Now, they were here in Jerusalem because of the conquests of Nebuchadnezzar driving the people through the land. They sought refuge in Jerusalem. And here God takes Jeremiah and says, take the Rechabites in. Show these people unto the house of Judah. Basically, what's going on? Thus have we obeyed the voice, verse number 8, that the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we our wives, our sons, nor our daughter, daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell in Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words? saith the Lord. He says, look, the Rechabites heard the words and they obeyed the words of their father Jehonadab. Will you not listen to me? The words of Je Jehonadab, the son of, of Rechab, that he commanded, has sons not to drink wines are performed, for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, and here's the part I love right here, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he hath commanded you. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. See what happened here? Many people use this text as a basis for why one should not drink, but it's really not about that. It's about Jonadab's, in spite of being an outsider, he was obedient to God. He didn't follow Jehu along with his idolatry that was continued. So the Rechabites and Jonadab are lifted up as an example of faith. 
right? The the Rechabites, much like the Levites having no place to call their own, here was the Rechabites. The Rechabites were actually the the descendants of uh, the Kenites. Think of Moses' wife, Zipporah. She was a Kenite. Heidi mentioned Ruth and being in Bethlehem. What was Ruth? She was a Moabite. But this Moabitess would be the grandmother of King David and so on and so on and so on. We see God has a remnant of people in Israel even to this day. I believe there are Rechabites scattered somewhere throughout the world who God has preserved and will be with him when he comes again. Amen. Amen. Think of it. The promised land. We've seen the pictures of Israel. We see it today. But it is, a, it is a, a land that will be about ten times its size that it is now. And God has preserved the remnant. And these Rechabites. Oh, think of the Rechabites. Virtually unknown to the rest of the world. But they were known unto God. And he will preserve them or is preserving them that they will stand forever. They were, as Peter tells us in back in, in the book of Deuteron- Deuteronomy and Numbers. I have my notes down on the floor someplace. But in Numbers chapter 19, as God was telling about to tell Moses the Ten Commandments, God gave these promises that if Israel were to follow his commandments and obey him, they would be a peculiar people, that they would be priests and priests and kings forever. And all the people said, Amen. We will do whatever God tells us. And we all know what happened while God was, while Moses was up on the mountain receiving those commandments, his people were down building idols. And then passing the buck to other people about their building idols. But these Rechabites and other remnant groups of people have been preserved forever. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says about the church. Remember the church is made of Jew and Gentile together. That those that would believe in Jesus Christ would be a chosen nation and a peculiar nation priesthood praise God by that or of that it's by grace through faith it wasn't because the Rechabites didn't drink smoke or chew it was because the Rechabites through Jonadab had faith in the Lord they listened to him meanwhile his own people rejected him today we have an opportunity opportunity to go into the world and those who believe in the gospel will be like that Rechabite. They'll be able to stand before the Lord forever because of salvation. Amen? What a promise. I thought it went 15 minutes instead of 10 today. But the Rechabites, think of that. Peculiar people who had faith in the Lord, and because of that faith, they will be known forever. Amen? That's what we have through Jesus Christ. Faith in him, we are indeed a peculiar people unto him, set apart for his glory and honor. Amen? Just believe him. That's all we have to do that... Jeremiah was speaking to a whole nation that didn't believe. All they had to do was believe God. But they didn't. Even so much as a few chapters later that Jeremiah would be, King Jehoiakim would throw him into jail because he didn't preach good things. He preached judgment. He preached the truth. May we also stick with the truth, even when it hurts. But praise God, in this age of grace, in the church age, we have but one thing to do. It's to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. I'll close right there. 
But think of that. The peculiar people saved by grace and showing forth the salvation by their works. Amen. Let's close.